Well, good morning, one and all. Welcome back to Garden America. After a couple of weeks uh, hiatus, we are back in the studio, live on Facebook, pre-recorded on BizTalk Radio. Good morning, good afternoon, whatever the case may be. I'm Brian Maine, along with uh, my good buddy, my co-host, Tiger Palafox, today. Uh, yes, we have a missing person. Uh, nobody <laughs> sitting in John's chair. John is off for one more week. Uh, you and I took the past couple of weeks off. I went to Wyoming. You went to several states. Yeah, I was in um, Nevada, Arizona, Utah. Did you go to Four Corners? No. Okay. I didn't go there. But that but Colorado, Arizona, Utah. New, New Mexico. And Nevada. Something like, hey, something something like, like that. that, yeah. But you had quite but a trip. We had, Two we had, weeks. We, yeah, yeah. We, we toured all over. We, we did the whole, um, what is that, Vegas to Zion, Bryce Canyon, Moab, Yosemite. the Arches. Yosemite, Tahoe. Beautiful part of the country. Yeah, just all the kind of like close to us kind of national parks. Right. And um, took the kids. The Two family, weeks is a, is a long time. You, you get and back, road tripped it. And you get back, you got back home last night. And I I started the odometer on my car when we, I reset it when we started. And it was about a little over 2,600 miles. Seriously? Yeah. Boy, if you were driving across country, that would have taken you probably to Chicago and beyond. Really? I mean, close. Dang. Yeah, I close. Don't, I, I don't you know, know. you know, it's so funny because last December we drove, we attempted to drive attempted to, to drive, Wyoming. Right, it took us two days to get even hundred miles close to it. Right, <laughs> and this time around it took an hour and a half to get there, <laughs> all, in all total. Yeah. you know, so I think we'll be flying next time. Maybe take a road trip, but it was a good time. Yes, we missed all of you out there yeah. uh, watching us on Facebook Live. Thank you so much for your support, putting up with us not being with you the past couple of weeks. But again, if you go to our website, to GardenAmerica.com. You'll see uh, we've done a lot of things to the, uh, the website itself, thanks to our IT guy, Daniel. Previous shows, podcast, articles, it's all there. Sign up for the newsletter on GardenAmerica.com. Yeah, and then John's still out there vacationing. Two weeks off wasn't enough for him. No, he's in, and now he was in Idaho a few weeks ago. Now he's in Indiana. Right. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So he's visiting family. Great time to visit family. All it is. Around. It's a good time. Now let's yeah. talk about the heat oh, wow. here in San Diego, Southern California. Up your watering schedule, people. Right. And, you know, it's so funny because during that whole trip, you know, I'm out there in Utah in these desert areas in Arizona. The hottest it got on the trip was in California. California, right? Yeah, they, places. Had, they had a bit of the uh, monsoonal moisture out in the desert when we were there. So a little cloudy, a little cooler weather, even a few drops of rain while we were out there. But in Southern California and in California alone, it was hot. Yep. It was dry. And, um, you know, I could see it in the landscape when we were driving through. Now, sure. now, this is the one thing I thought about when I was gone was the heat. Mm -hmm. I, I did heavy watering before I left. Yeah. Came back. Everything was okay. I was going to take a picture of something, and I forgot to, to take it and bring it in, but I will in time for next week. Do you remember the Australian bottlenose tree that John gave me uh, about two, three months ago? Yes. Yeah. Stood about, oh, if I was standing up. It was between my waist and my shoulders. Okay. John says, don't water it. Let it be. Okay. You know, which I did. Well, about two or three weeks after that, my monthly um, aquarium maintenance guy came over. So as we're draining the water, he says, hey, can I uh, feed your plants, water yeah, your plants? I it. said, yeah, go ahead. After he left, I saw that he had dumped it into the, uh, the bottle tree. Okay. The Australian bottleneck tree. Yeah. And I went, ah, I wasn't supposed to water it. Well, since then, this sucker has taken off. It is pushing 10 feet. Wow. And I know that, that if I told that to Johnny, he wouldn't believe me. I'm going to take a picture. I'm going to yeah. stand next to it. This sucker is up as high as the balcony now. Okay. I mean, it's, it's growing like uh, bamboo. It was that fish water. Something. It had to be. Yeah, that fish water is good. It's really good. There's a lot of uh, good bacteria yeah. and a lot of nutrients. Yeah. So, uh, but I was blown away to see how quick it's grown. Y you should just bottle that as a fertilizer and just call it right? fish water. Fish water. Fish water <laughs> fertilizer. Yeah. So uh, what's happening at the nursery now? We're in, into July. You know it's summertime. So yeah. it's it's hot. A lot of people are slowing down on the planting. But, um, you know, I was, I was on the morning news three weeks ago now. KUSI? Yeah, here locally. Mm -hmm. And I was talking about, you know, the summertime vegetables and stuff. And they want to have me back because right now is the time of year when also people are doing a lot of color bowls. Because they're having a July 4th sure, sure. party weekend. They're going to have people over for just a general, you know, summertime get-together. So right now a lot of people are putting together color bowls, which is great. You know, mixing mixing some colors into a pot, you know, 
adding combinations where you have just maybe more than flowers by putting in some grasses or some trailing plants. So um, I think that's a big thing to do right now. But even besides the color, the succulents, people are doing a lot of these bowls with succulents as well. Right. So I think a lot of people are kind of focusing on just that curb appeal that, you know, uh, you know, get in the house looking sure. a little nicer at this moment yeah. in time. Now, I, I see a question on Facebook already. Can we water only twice a week? Yeah. You know, that that's that's a very generic question because it's, <laughs> it's all going to depend. Depends on where you live, how hot it is, you know, how quickly, you know, your plants are taking up the moisture. Are they in pots? Are they in ground? Are they in the ground? So there's really no well direct answer to that, is there? Well, no, you're right. And not only that, with the restrictions, the restrictions of watering are based on each municipality. For instance, in, right. in San Diego right now, we are allowed to water three times a week. That's what they say. They, but they, they don't say, say how long you can water. They don't say how long. They don't right. say what days. Um, you know, they're very vague on the description. And we've talked about this, and that's because San Diego County is different than most of the other state. Meaning, San Diego County has uh, done a great job on diversifying their water resources. So we have a desalination plant in Carlsbad. We get water from the um, Imperial Valley. We get water from the Colorado River. Sounds like you're saying we have plenty of water. In San Diego, you know, it's an argument that we right. are not part of the drought. Now, in areas like Los Angeles, where they fully depend on their own aqueduct from the Colorado River and their own water resources locally they they are short they they need right. more water um you know so their restrictions might be different than our restrictions and then when you get into other areas like san francisco or you know other areas like arizona they might have other water restrictions but no matter what the restrictions are the best way to water are going to be at night you know especially in if, if you live anywhere west of oh i don't know let's say you know, Louisiana. West of Louisiana. Yeah. That's a lot of states. It is. Uh, at night, you, you, the reason why they tell you not to water at night is because of of, of fungal issues or mold issues or, or disease issues. But that's if the if things if, don't dry out. Exactly. Humid. Humid areas. Right, right. right. So, you know, there's not a lot. I mean, some parts of Texas, I guess, would be humid. But, you know, mostly everything west of Texas, right. let's say, is, is very dry in the right. day. And you're going to have some humidity in Texas as well. Yeah. But, you know, so we don't have the disease issues, which means if you water your lawn at 9 p.m. at night, that water is sitting there 10, 11, 12, sure. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 in the morning before it starts to evaporate, which means that the roots have all of that time to be able to absorb it. Sure. It stays in the ground. It doesn't evaporate off. And, um, you know, you're going to maximize the water in the soil, where if you water it you know, 6 a.m. or 7 a.m., half of the water's already gone because it's evaporating after an hour of it being around. Right. And now, if it's in pots, it's very easy to tell if you need to water. Stick your finger in the pot, maybe, uh, what do they call it, an autonomer? What is it? Uh, the, uh, the, what, your finger? The moisture. <laughs> well, your finger's the easiest the way to do it. The moisture meter? The moisture meter, which John doesn't believe yeah, in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anything like that in a pot, yeah. then that'll give you an idea of if you should water. As an example, our tomato plants, it, they, it dries out very quickly. They're in pots. I can tell they need water. Some of the smaller cherry uh, plants, um, I should say t uh, tomato cherry plants, the leaves start to get a little wilty. A little droopy. Droopy. Right. It needs water. Yep. You know, they're, just pay attention to, to your garden, to each individual plant. You yep. could have one plant that looks great. Next to it, it needs water. And it helps if you let it dry out a little bit because it kind of forces the plant to toughen up and grow a little bit. Toughen up, huh? It does because... I've had plants where I've watered them regularly because they're flowers or small vegetables or whatever. Right, right. And I go later on, I pull the plant out, and the roots haven't grown. And it's because I always watered it, and they never needed to grow. Right, But if right. you kind of force it to, to grow because it's looking for water, mm -hmm. you're going to make a stronger plant. Sure. Yeah. All right. Hey, that said, I know we've got to get to the quote, which we yeah. will. Maybe not right now, but okay. I do want to talk about, because we've got about a minute till our first break. Our guest today yeah. on uh, Garden America, somebody we haven't spoken with in a long time, but he's a good friend of the show. Great friend of the show. We're having him back. He's had a, a, quite a story. I don't know how much he's going to share with us, but Lance Walheim will be joining us. And we're not talking roses. Um, we are talking a little bit of citrus, but mostly we're going to be talking gin. We're going to be talking about gin. Yeah, yeah. With, with Lance Walheim. Exactly. Pretty All right. exciting stuff. Do you, by chance, do you have the quote in front of you? I do. By chance. Why don't you go ahead and knock that out? It's, okay. a, it's a, a longer quote, but a good quote that uh, John 
puts in that newsletter every week. Okay, no mistakes, <laughs> right. Tiger. Come on. No mistakes. Oh, goodness. Yeah. All right. I love fresh citrus and always keep lemons, limes, and oranges on hand. They come in handy for spritzing up quickly grilled meats, seafoods, and vegetables, especially when followed by a quick drizzle of extra virgin olive oil. And that's uh, from Emerald Lagasse, you know, right. the chef. And you can't go wrong. And, and the nice thing about those citrus is they keep so well on your counter. When Absolutely. you need them, they're there. They're right there. Okay, it is break time, our first uh, break. Uh, that is the end of segment number one. Long way to go. Uh, thank you for those tuned in on Biz Talk Radio. This is a pre recorded show from last week. The rest of us here on Facebook Live, it is live. We're going to take a break, a uh, quicker break than on Biz Talk Radio. Back after these messages, we've got Lance Walheim coming up next. And again, those messages coming your way for those listening on Biz Talk Radio. Okay, welcome back to the program. This is Garden America. Thank you so much. We've been off for the past couple of weeks. It is good to get back into the studio. A little uh, face-to-face time with you on Facebook Live and those listening on BizTalk Radio. All right, Tiger, we, uh, we talked about Lance Walheim being our guest today. I just spoke with him. He's ready to go. Let's bring on our good friend Lance Walheim and get this, uh, pull this train out of the station, as they say. All righty. Now, we haven't talked to Lance in a long time, so it's, it's wonderful to have him back on the program. And Normally, we would bring on Lance for help with some Bayer products or roses, and we know he has his, or had his citrus ranch out there in the uh, Central Valley of California as well. But, um, you know, a little bit of some changes Lance have had, and, and he's done some moves and yep. doing some different things. So, Lance, welcome to the program. Good morning, guys. How are you? We're doing really, really well. Lance. Yeah, glad, glad to be here, glad to be in studio, and glad to be talking with you, Lance. Now, tell us a little bit, first off, um, you know, you've had a passion for citrus for some time now. You know, you had a specialty citrus farm in the Central Valley for quite a bit of time that you focused on unique, not, not just your orange or lemon or lime, but unique stuff. And, you know, that passion has carried you into something new. Tell us a little bit about your venture now. Well, you're right. I had a citrus, especially citrus ranch for um, over 30 years, and um, we had a marketing company called California Citrus Specialties, um, which we marketed our fruit as well. And um, over those years, we kept getting a lot of questions about, um, you know, different citrus that was used in different types of spirits and alcohols and things from lemon cello to uh, bergamot sour oranges in, in gin and other uh, spirits. And so one time I was talking to a distiller, and he, he was telling me how they use dried bergamot rind to make a gin. And we grew bergamots on the, on the ranch. And so we started taking very fine pieces of the bergamot rind, you know, just the colorful part, and squeezing it and then rub it in on the edge of our gin and tonic and then throw it in the cocktail. Uh-huh. And the results were magical. The bergamot sour orange, which, you know, people know from Earl Grey tea, um, and it's used in various perfumes. It's a wonderful citrus tree. They don't know exactly what the background is, but it's probably a sour orange, lemon, or citron hybrid, maybe with some lime in there. Anyway, it made the drink so wonderful. I started thinking about, maybe I should make a bergamot gin. And for several years, I thought about it, and I just couldn't find the right distiller to help me out and do it. 
And then I happened to be in a Tascadero. My wife was doing some business, and I was walking around early in the morning, and I stumbled on the Central Coast Distillery. I looked in the window, and there was somebody in there. The place was closed, and I knocked, and he said, well, come on in. And so we started talking. It was Eric Olson, who was a, distri- was a distiller. And I told him I'm a specialty citrus grower, and I wanted to make some bergamot gin, and he got all excited. And before I knew it, I was bringing him all these different citruses over for him to try and use in the restaurant at the distillery. So we really hit it off. He was a great guy and really into citrus. So before you know it, we had we went through oh, multiple formulas, maybe six at least, and came up with Walheim Ranch Gin, which was uh, just introduced a couple weeks ago, which is a bergamot sour orange forward gin. Also has um, you know other botanicals in it, and it's it's just great, and I'm really excited about it because I, I I definitely um, want to. F- put my hands out in all different ways to use citrus, which uh, has really been fun. Now, now I got to um, hit on this a minute because I got a image of the bergamot orange. And now people that are watching on Facebook Live on the screen yeah, can it's see. Yeah, green. it's green, isn't it? it, it? It's green. Yeah. It's, it's got a very bumpy skin, and it's the size of roughly a lime. Am I describing it pretty good, Lance? No, you're not. Oh. Uh, the bergamot, you're actually looking at a yuzu. I've oh. seen that on the Internet as well. Oh, okay. Um, the bergamot sour orange is sometimes picked on the greener side, but um, it's yellow when it's fully ripe. It's large. It's kind of pear-shaped. Um, and the rind, which the oils are used from, is very aromatic. It's a really pretty tree. Um, but, yeah, I know there's some confusion with what the bergamot is. We also grow yuzus, but the bumpy green one is a yuzu. Okay. Yeah, I was looking online this morning. I typed that in, and that's what kind of came up. So Lance, I thought, did you say yuzu? How do you spell that? Yuzu, Y-U-Z-U. Okay. It's a, we grow those, too. It's an Asian fruit that's uh, traditionally used to make a ponzu sauce, but it's also used in a lot of alcohols. You know, there's such re- um, excitement in the craft uh, distilling whole industry right now with all these wonderful flavors that our people are using. Um, in our gin, besides um, having a strong juniper flavor, which all gins have, um, we've also used some fennel, some orris root, even a little bit of tea in it. But people now are making gins with allspice, cardamom, coriander, sage, lavender, angelica, bay, and, of course, all different kinds of citrus. Um, but the thing about it is the gin that we made, the Walheim Ranch gin, we use fresh citrus rind, and that really brings out the bergamot flavor. It's, it's really quite unique. And so describe the bergamot flavor because it's an orange, so obviously people understand what oranges taste like. Yeah, but it's, is a it, but it's a sour orange, orange. Or a bitter orange. Uh-huh. So the inside is basically used for the rind. The inside is sour. It's juicy. People do use it for recipes and drinks sometimes, but it's primarily the oils that they want. So it's a large yellow fruit, often kind of pear-shaped. In other words, it has kind of a, a bump on the top of it. Um, and it's, like I said, use, it's that unusual flavoring that you get in Earl Grey treat. Earl Grey tea, sorry, and um, it's it's really unique fruit. And the do you just use the rind, or do people actually use the um, inside of the orange as well? It's mostly the rind. For the gin, we just use the rind. That's where the flavorful oils are. And if you bit into uh, the inside of a bergamot sour orange, you'd go, whoa, pretty bitter. But people do use it occasionally, but it's primarily the rinds. You also see it in various perfumes, in cosmetics. Um, it's it's used dramatically. And we um, bergamot oil, which if you look online, is very expensive, Um and uh, highly sought after. Traditionally, the, the bergamots are grown in Calabria, Italy. There's some grown on what, in Western Africa, and then the dried rind or the oils are sent over to the United States. So, but there are some small plantings of bergamots in California, um, of which mine was one of the larger ones. Yeah. And so, you know, that's really fun. And, and you know, I have to tell you a story. We're going to take a break in about a minute. When we get back from the break, I want to kind of talk about 
gin in the process because again that's plants as well you know gin comes from junipers but um i'm, I'm kind of bummed lance because i was actually driving down from morgan hill yesterday and after i got off the phone with you yesterday i'm like oh you know what i'm gonna swing by a tascadero on my way down i'm gonna pick up a bottle of this gin and i'm gonna surprise um surprise lance that i have it here in studio and um, they were closed. They were closed, like you said. And so I didn't get an opportunity. So anybody living in Atascadero, if you can go to the uh, Central Coast Distiller for me, pick up a bottle and run it down to San Diego. Yeah, there you I, go. I'll, I'll buy that from you, and I will buy you a bottle of gin as well. But okay. when we get back from yep. break, we'll continue talking with Lance Walheim. Yeah, do stay with us. Hey, those on Facebook Live, questions, comments for this very interesting topic directed toward Lance, feel free. We will monitor them. Uh, those on Biz Talk Radio, thank you for your support. We're going to take a break. Back after these messages, welcome to Garden America. Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox here on Garden America. And again, don't miss those messages on Biz Talk Radio. Hey, just like that, if you're tuned in on uh, Facebook Live, we are back. Thank you to those that are listening to this pre-recorded show on Biz Talk Radio. John Bagnasco is off uh, yet again today. He's back with us next weekend. I'm Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox. Thank you for all your support here. Garden America, the show just continues to grow, and that's all because of you. So thank you very much. Guest today is Lance Walheim. You think he'd be talking about his backyard, roses, maybe some trees growing. Nope, we're talking about gin, Tiger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and before the break, Lance gave us the rundown on the bergamot gin that um, he paired up to create with the Central Coast Distilling Company. But um, tell us a little bit about gin, you know, because I think not everybody knows where gin comes from, Lance. Right, sure. You know, and just in case anybody else stops by, they definitely want to uh, check out the website for Central Coast Distillery. Um, like you say, it's right off of 101. Uh, the website is foragerspirits.net. Forager Spirits is one word. Um, and that is the best place to get it and find out about the hours. Um, we're going to set up something um, in the next couple of weeks where people will be able to mail order the gin. Um, so I'll definitely let you guys know, yeah. but I'm so sorry you missed out. It would have been I perfect. Know. I know. I was driving, driving yeah. down. I'm like, oh, I'm going to swing by the 101 and just cruise right by. And I was cruising by, I think around two o'clock and I don't think they were open until five. So, oh uh, yeah. 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 They're open. They're open, uh, afternoons and evenings, I think on Thursday, Friday and Saturday. Yeah. But back to your question, Tiger, at a very basic level, what gin is, is that it, it's a neutral spirit that's flavored with juniper berries. All gin is flavored with juniper berries. Now, if you take a, what the difference is um, for something that you buy at a liquor store is that th that neutral spirit is redistilled with juniper berries and also with a variety of other botanicals that we talked about to take the oils out and create that really smooth gin that we we all like so basically that's what it is it's a neutral spirit that's flavored with junipers and of course there's also a lot of other botanicals that are used so it's it's the berry itself not the gin uh the juniper foliage because when you smell it, gin obviously it smells like juniper and right you know junipers smell obviously like junipers as well but you're just using the berry itself, not any full, yeah, not the full. Actually, we call it a berry, and what it really is is a fleshy cone. Obviously, oh, you know, yeah. junipers are mm -hmm. conifers. And um, so, yeah, it's basically the dried um, cone. And the most common juniper is Juniperus communis. That's mm -hmm. the one that's usually used to make gin. Uh -huh. We all know there's a lot of different junipers, and some of those can be used. But there are other ones that shouldn't be used, and actually some of them are reported to be poisonous. So anybody who's going to try this shouldn't just <laughs> run out and grab the berries off any gin yeah. um, unless they've got somebody who's experienced and knows what they're talking I mean, off of any gin juniper. juniper, unless they're experienced or know exactly what they're getting. So you can get the dried uh, juniper berries in most supermarkets in the spice section, or you can buy them online. Okay. 
And so they, it is just kind of a, a, a common juniper that they use. There's nothing real special about the juniper. And now, like you said, there are different junipers out there. And I'm sure, you know, different distillers probably say, oh, well, we use this juniper for whatever flavor, just like wine grapes or anything else when it comes to exactly. distilling. But, um, you know, for the most part, the common juniper is just the one. Now, now, do you know, you know, I've, I've seen a juniper bush and I've seen the, um, you know, the berries off of the juniper. Does it require a lot or do, does it not require? Because they're very potent. They, you know, junipers are very fragrant. They're very strong plants. So I would imagine it doesn't require too much, but, you know, I, they might. I don't know. It, it really doesn't. If you were, you know, there's a, there are different types of gin as well. Um, you know, the most common that people know are the London d- dry gins, but there are other ones out there like Old Tom gin and things. So, so there are some variations in how the gin is made. Um, but you're right. Juniper berries are very strong. Um, if you're going to, let's just say you're going to try to make your, your own gin, which you can do, and people do. And in the olden days, it used to be called bathtub gin. <laughs> but people are making some some pretty good stuff, and yeah. basically uh, the recipes that I've seen have said, okay, if you've got a couple tablespoons of juniper berry, say for a fifth of your neutral spirit, which in most cases is vodka, uh-huh. that should be enough. But then you only soak it for maybe 24 to 36 hours, and you start tasting it, and then after it's been in there and you're happy with that juniper flavor, that's when you want to start using some of the other botanicals that uh, that people use. And uh, there's just no end to what people are putting in, in different spirits these days. So then now take us to the bergamot orange and you're using the skin. Um, you know, let's say a, a standard bottle of uh, alcohol is 750 milliliters. And I know this is probably hard for you because – you know, you make, I'm sure they make them in batches much larger than that. But um, right. does it require a lot of the orange is is in there or does it not require a lot of the orange as well? Is it you just, it, it just a hint of It require a lot of the orange. I, um, and it's important if you're going to try to make something like that or even if you're, you know, just going to throw one in your gin and tonic, a piece of the bergamot sour orange or something, um, that you be careful. You start You start with just a little bit maybe some long strips off the rind and make sure that you just get that colored part. That's where all the oils are Mm -hmm. and let that soak in there. And you may get some, some color from the citrus. Uh, You're going to want to strain it after you've done it. But the best thing is just to taste it as you go and experiment because um, when we look at a bergamot sour orange, uh, and even when we look at things like lemons and stuff that we're going to use to make lemoncello, the oils are really the strongest when the fruit is in what they call the silver stage, when it's just going from green to yellow. So at that point, the oils are really high. So if you're using it at that point, you're going to get more flavor out of it than you would, say, a couple months later when the fruit has been on the tree for, for a while. Really? So, so, yeah. so the most potent oils are when it's going from that you know, not ripe phase of green to just the barely ripe phase of either the orange or the yellow for it. Um, right. That's well, when yeah, you're... and it's important to realize that, you know, the, the color of the rind and citrus often has very little to do with the ripeness of the fruit. Um, you know, if you, um, you know, a lot of oranges and things will start to color up, say, in November or December, but they won't be ripe until um, – you know, much later in the year. So color is not the best indication. The best indication is to actually taste the fruit. But mm-hmm. you are right. That stage when it's going from the green to the yellow is really when you can, and really the, the oils intensify. And if you can go out and pick a bergamot oil and just, or orange and just scratch it with your fingernails, and the oils will just explode. And you'll have that Earl Grey or the perfume aroma. It's, it's really strong. So if you use the rind at that point, you're going to get a stronger flavor than you might later on. Okay. So, yeah, you got to really, you know, know where the fruit is in that. And then, um, you know, obviously, you know, you re- you're uh, having batches of, of this. And so when you're kind of creating, you know, these batches, 
does Eric over there kind of uh, blend things as well, or is it just like here's the batch and the way that particular batch might come out a little bit stronger or a little bit weaker based on, you know, like what you just said about the fruit going into it? Yeah, that's 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 really the chan the the challenge to it. But you're constantly just like you could do making your own, constantly testing that. And like I said, we went through several batches of four really where we went to the bottling stage. And you know, we found out things. For instance, one of the herbs that's in there used a lot is angelica. Mm-hmm. Um, and we found the angelica, which is a um, you know, let's see, it's a relative of celery, I guess. It kind of gives a, a licorice flavor. Yeah. But we felt it was given an off flavor, so we switched to fennel, um, and that gave us just a little tiny background flavor that we wanted from it. So you do you do have to watch it as you're going. Um, and the distillation process is, is really a science, and if you're into small batch um, spirits, going to see Eric, you'll get a lesson in distilling. He teaches classes and Man, he's a master at that stuff. So, yeah, he's really good at blending. But you're right. That's a challenge. When you're using a rind at different stages, you have to make sure you're not getting way off base. Yeah. But um, that's the, the beauty of small batch spirits. Is, yeah. You know, you have that. You can adjust as you go. Yeah. Hey, we are going to have to take another break here in about uh, a minute, Lance. Um, when we get back from break, I want to continue chatting with you about uh, your ventures because – you you um, are are changing a little bit. I, I I don't know, and I want to ask you: Are you continuing to grow citrus? Because I know there's been some moves in your life, and um, you know, are there going to be some more um, spirits in the future from you? And what can we look forward to in the future? So when we get back from break, we will continue chatting with Lance Walhan. Yeah, that was going to be my question. One of my questions, Tiger. <laughs> okay, Jen, what next, Lance? So do stay with us here on Facebook Live. And again, you're welcome to ask Lance any question you'd like pertaining to our topic today there. Facebook Live, those on BizTalk Radio. You can catch our show live every Saturday. We kick things off at 8.06 Pacific Time, 11.06 Eastern Time Zone. Watch us on Facebook. Go to Garden America Radio Show, and there we are. YouTube channel as well. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. And welcome back to the show this morning, talking to Lance Walheim here on Garden America, talking about spirits, gin, how it's made, how we got into this whole process. And again, uh, for those uh, that are, I was going to say watching, no, those listening on BizTalk Radio, this is the final segment of hour number one. We've got news coming up top of the hour, then we are back at six minutes after. As we always say, we truly hope that your market carries both hours, or at least one or two hours, one hour, second hour here on Garden America, as long as you catch Garden America at some point during your weekend, Tiger. Yeah, definitely. And, and um, I want to mention to Lance right now, we have a discussion happening on our Facebook uh, chat between uh, Kim and um, Cheryl and Lenore, and they're discussing, you know, these uh, infused alcohols, and, you know, they're discussing that, oh, you know, I don't, I don't drink alcohol, but, you know, I, they sound enticing and they sound fun. And now I will say that, I feel like I've heard that a lot of people are doing these infused drinks just minus the alcohol. Yeah, and yeah. and they they are having events or parties or there are places that you can go to restaurants that have a lot of these really neat infused flavors in a in a soda in a, mm-hmm. just a common juice or or something that's going to give them the same almost feeling that they're drinking an alcoholic drink. But just minus the vodka, minus the gin or whatever right. it is. Mm-hmm. Right. And um, so I think that, you know, that definitely is something that they could do with what you're talking about. And, um, you know, that's kind of an interesting thing. Now, it's funny because I mentioned that because, you know, Lance, I mean, I'm sure you have been following spirits for a while. And, you know, we've had these ups and downs and, you know, the, the high the high alcohol ipa beers were real popular for a while and now we're moving into a spritzer <laughs> or what are they called these um you right. know, these spritzer drinks seltzer drinks yep, you yep. know where we're back to like the real light stuff and um so you know with your venture 
Um, obviously, you know, we're talking gin. W what are some other things that you're looking for in the future? Well, you know, what you, it's an interesting point that you make because the citrus family has such a huge varieties of flavor. Um, and you can use those um, to make drinks that are non-alcoholic. And, and, you know, there are a lot of those types of recipes uh, on the web that you can use. Um, one of the things, you know, we've had so much fun um, with Eric, and again, that's Central Coast Distillery, that I, we're going to explore some other things, I think. We, you know, we've got some challenges with this, uh, this gin to get the Walheim Ranch gin to get it distributed the way we want it to, um, and we'll keep you up to date with that. But we've got um, some other things. I'm real interested in what we can do with the yuzu. Um, with uh, that thing, there's also a Japanese fruit called the sudachi, that we that I really has got some unique flavors. So I think we're going to continue to play around with some of the, the great flavors that come from citrus. Hey, Lance, a couple of questions here. I want to make sure we keep up. Uh, this is from Cheryl, who says, question for Lance, since it's the rind that's producing the flavor, is there a specific fruit maturity stage for harvesting? It, I said, say that again. Is okay. there a specific, yeah, there, specific oh, stage to harvest? Yeah, think, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think yeah, Lance kind of touched again, on that. I think it's at that the ideal. I think you can start when the fruit is starting to go from green to yellow. And most of California, I think that's going to be close to the end of November, early December. But you can continue to use it um, for several months after that. The bergamot sour orange hangs really well on the tree. Um, and those oils will always be there. They ju you may just want to use a little bit more rind to kind of give it a more intense flavor. Okay, Lance, here's one from Patty. Uh, she's interested in planting fragrant plants and shrubs. Will the bergamot orange exude its fragrance when you walk by? Is this something you can enjoy, like a lavender, perhaps? Uh, no, well, the, the, the nice, one nice thing about the bergamot, it does have very fragrant and large flowers, uh, you know, compared to a lot of other citrus. But, no, I don't think so, um, that it won't be one of those things that you, unless you brush by the plant, you might get a little aroma from the leaves. It's really when you grab a fruit off the tree and then scratch it with your fingernails or rub it with your hand, get those oils on it that you really experience. But it's not something that just emanates from the tree on its own. Yeah, good question because, yeah, you know, you wonder that. And like you say, I think, you know, citrus in general, they do have a kind of a sweet fragrance when they are in the flowering stage. But, right. yeah, in the fruiting stage, you don't always get that fragrance, the citrus right. fragrance. As you're, when you're walking through a, a, a lemon orchard you don't always just smell lemon you know no yeah you're right you don't but a lot of citrus also does have very fragrant foliage and, mm -hmm. and lemons are one so yeah. um it's something if you happen to brush up against or break some of the leaves and things you, you will get some aroma from it yeah definitely um so yeah lance um so what are some things that you're working on now well, like you had kind of led into, I have, we have had some changes in the family. We wanted to be closer to our grandkids, so we've been moved up to um, Oregon. Um, and uh, I'm still going to be involved with the citrus industry in California. My books um, on citrus are desperate and need to be updated, and I'm planning on working on that. Hopefully <laughs> we can get something going there. Um, and I've got some, some other gardening projects I want to do. we got to get the house order here and get the garden planted. You know, it's been up here. It's been rainy and cool, and it's just yeah, uh, get used to that, Lance. brutal on the vegetables. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's right. very, very different from where you were before. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a California guy. Born and raised in California, it was hard to move off the ranch, but the, the ranch was actually bought by a really good friend of ours, and so um, I'm still involved, giving him advice things, and I've still got a number of projects I want to do in the citrus field. So I'll be around Nice, nice. Well, we look forward to um, hearing more from you. Sure. And um, again, anybody in the Atascadero area that's coming down to San Diego, <laughs> send me a message. We would love for you to pick up a bottle of the gin over there at the uh, Central Coast Distilling. Hey, Tiger, you're serious about this, too. I right? am. Yeah, I am. Exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll buy you a bottle just for you driving it down. No problem at all. I want to try this. I want to try this. Well, 
we'll make sure you get a bottle one way or the other, Tiger. Don't yeah, worry. Great. Yeah. You know what's funny, Lance, is that that was my uh, drink of choice in, in college was was gin and tonics. Really? I, I, I don't uh-huh. know. I just liked gin. I, and... I never got along with gin myself. Really? Eh, you oh, know yeah, what? That it's was my a... favorite. Yeah. It, was always, it always right. seemed refreshing. Well, wait till you try a gin and tonic with the Walheim Ranch gin. There you You're go. You're going to love it. I will. I will. Well, well, Lance, thank you very much for joining us this weekend. Have a great holiday weekend. Happy Fourth of July. And uh, good luck. And then, yes, keep us in the loop when you have uh, new things coming around. Shoot me a message, and we'll bring you back on. I'll do it. Thanks very much, guys. Happy Fourth. You bet. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lance. Wow, he has, uh, since the last time we talked to Lance, uh, he's gone through a lot of changes. He's moved. He's into this whole gin uh, thing that he's got going and obviously knows a lot about it because he was very detailed in his explanation of how the whole process works. Yeah, and I mean, you know, being involved with citrus for so long, there's so many things, whether it's food, right. drinks, um, oils, and, 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 and oils in so many ways when it comes to citrus that it's pretty cool. We got to take a break for our friends on Biz Talk Radio. News coming up. And again, as I mentioned, uh, if you uh, get hour number one, we appreciate that. Hour number two, both hours even better. So uh, Biz Talk Radio news coming up. We're going to be back with our Facebook Live friends and more of your questions and comments. Again, this is Garden America wishing you a very happy Fourth of July weekend. But remember, don't blow up your fingers. Stay with us. Welcome back to the show. This is Garden America. For those on Biz Talk Radio, this is hour number two. Hopefully you caught the first hour with our guest, Lance Walheim. For the rest of you on Facebook, you should be caught up, so we do appreciate that. want to uh, recommend again that you go to our website as much as you can. The website's always changing and evolving. We've got previous shows up there, podcasts. We've got articles. You can sign up for the newsletter. Check it out at GardenAmerica.com. And again, it's not the same thing. Every time you go there, it's going to be a little bit different, so keep up with us here on Garden America. All right, Tiger, uh, you were a gin and tonic guy yeah. in, in, in college. Now, I did my fair share of drinking besides beer, uh, 151 and Coke. So I pr- I know. <laughs> you, went, you went straight to it. I'm talking about how I didn't get along with gin. <laughs> but um, anyway, I think it's great what Lance is doing. Yeah. And, uh, boy, it's like a, a new chapter of his life moving up to Oregon and uh, still uh, maintaining some things on the ranch that his good friend purchased from him. Yeah, that's a really neat story. Um, before the show, you were asking what was happening in the nursery now with the time of year. We're summertime. It's hot. It's July. The spring is come and gone. Yeah. It's not fall yet. So <laughs> color. You talked about color. Yeah. I was saying color bowls are the big thing right now. I mean, obviously, with the July 4th weekend happening this weekend, um, people are getting their house ready for having people over. And then through the summer months, people are always entertaining, having dinner parties, mm-hmm. having people over. Um, so color bowls are a big hit right now. And one of the things that always stuck with me and I like to share with our listeners is when you're doing a, a combination pot, if you can think of these three basic principles when you're doing a pot, it'll make it almost look professionally done. And no matter, no matter what you do And what I, what it was, the description was, it was a thriller plant, which is something kind of your standout plant. Maybe it's a grass, a little bit taller, something with some flowers if you want it. Filler plant, so something that fills around the midsection of that pot. So you got these three levels in the pot. The the thriller is the tallest plant in there. The filler is that medium. And then the spiller, which is the draping, the cascading. A thriller and spiller. Yeah, thriller, filler, and spiller. Filler. Okay. If you do those three basic principles in your arrangement or in your color bowl, for the most part, you can make it look professional because you, you're adding depth to the plant. You're not just filling it just with flowers. Mm. You're, you're actually adding maybe some elements to it, whether it's a, a, a different texture of foliage, um, maybe a different color of, of plant. And then the cascading is always nice because that can do – you can take any pot and you're covering the pot. So, so it doesn't right. really matter what the right. pot looks like, You know, whether it's a plastic terracotta okay. one or – the, the focus is on the thriller – 
the, <laughs> the thriller in Manila. <laughs> but but the three dimensions you t- you spoke of. Yeah, exactly. So when you're shopping for your plants, um, this time of year when you're trying to put together arrangements, think of those three elements, and you go to the garden center and you say, "Hey, I would like to." create some you know combinations and i'm thinking something like a thriller and a filler and a spiller Mm -hmm. and a lot of garden centers will understand what you're asking for and give you the plants that would succeed now i will say you got to plan ahead though because especially when it comes to the spiller plant the cascading plant it's very difficult to find plants that are already cascading when you go to the nursery, right. they're still young. They're not yeah. quite cascading. So you don't see yet. the end result necessarily. Yeah, unless you do it well in advance where you can have that. And then that also is something that you could do is say you planted a spiller plant and it could carry, you know, year after year, season after season. And maybe you just change out one or two of the other elements in the pot to be more up to date. But that spiller plant is cascading a foot or you know, 10 inches down the pot already, and you leave that. Now, you know, Bacopa, Dichondra Silver Falls, General Dichondra, um, you know, there's a lot of wonderful, you know, cascading plants. I mean, String of string of Bananas, String of Pearls, succulents-wise, mm-hmm. those are all wonderful cascading plants that can just stay in the pot year after year. Is it year. possible? Could you go online? Do we have an image of that? Is um, an example I, of that maybe I'll on, pull on something. Google? Yeah, I'll Just pull so something. Just so people on Facebook can see, uh, can see it. And again, one of the advantages, if you're on BizTalk Radio, is yeah. being able to visually see what we're talking about many times here on yeah. the Garden America. So I just thought maybe something people could get an idea of. Yeah. As we all imagine what you're talking about with those three dimensions. Yeah, I'll pull some, I'll pull some images. And, you know, Proven Winners is a plant brand out there. And on their website, they do a great job. They, they um, kind of allow you to put your region in and they pick out plants that work with your region and that do those particular elements and you can put together arrangements. And then now now the challenge is going and finding those plants later on. But as you mentioned though, they'll they'll tailor that to the region that you're in. Yeah. You know, these plants do better here than those plants might in another state or, or a zone for that matter. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, you know, but you know, that is what's happening this time of year in the, in the homes is, you know, whether it's hanging baskets or whether mm-hmm. it's color bowls or whether it's potted plants. Because as you mentioned, Brian, before, you know, you just have pots. So right, right. now is the time of year for you that it's really easy for you to just add a few flowers here or there yep. to your pots. And boom, you spruced it up. Right, exactly. Nice, you know, exactly. and all is good. Yeah. And I've got close to 50 pots, I think, last time I counted. 50 different plants, be it roses, be it, be it succulents, whatever. Um, yeah. so much so that I had to move a lot of things from the patio out to the walkway. So now the neighbors get to enjoy it. <laughs> and, and I do a lot of the landscaping around the area. So I make it easy on the HOA landscaping team when they come in. <laughs> you know, I've already, I already raked this last week. Yeah. You know, and they came in and kind of tidied already up. Already cleaned up. Yeah, exactly. One of my, one of my favorite flowers right now is the uh, New Guinea Impatient. And you had, you have some sun, do you still have, have some sun patients? patients? Yeah, I do. I've had yeah. them for quite a while those are doing um you know the new guinea impatients are doing great this time of year i don't know are your sun patients blooming right absolutely are they we talked about uh, as we kicked off the show today people were asking well how much can you water uh you know two times a week three times a week drought whatever sun patients are one of the plants that'll tell you when they need water <laughs> the minute they start the to minute drill. they the are minute they need water i need water which might be a good indication of the rest of your plants, although all yeah. plants are different. But if your sun patients begin to droop, if the leaves on your tomato plants begin to droop, then that's a obviously you're going to water those two plants. Yeah. Look around your garden. Maybe somebody else needs water and they're just not telling you. You know, and then uh, I will say a disclaimer right now, though, too, because some people are the heavy handed waterer. Yes. And plants will droop when they're getting over too, too much. You know, and, I've. Too much water is is worse than than no water sometimes, right? Yeah, and I was going to say though the the big difference is is like what you just said. You water your sun patients if they're drooping mm-hmm. and they perk up. What does it take? Right away. It takes like an hour, right? You walk back out there right. and they're perked back up. I'd say less than an hour. It's amazing how okay. quickly they respond. Yeah. So, but if your sun patients are drooping and you water them and you walk out there like you say an hour later and they're still drooping, too much you're water. Overwatering. Yeah, overwatering exactly. <laughs> still, exactly. Still drooping. Because plants perk up, tomatoes, sun patients, sure. little flowers. When they need water and they're droopy, they perk up really quick. So if you go out there an hour or two later and they're still drooping, they don't need more water. It's probably because you are right. overwatering or they're not draining in that pot. Well, that's it. You, you can be a little more uh, dangerous, dangerous with your watering habits in pots 
because you should have good drainage. Yeah. You, you, you can tell that the, the water should drain uh, fairly easy, and it's easier to, to get a hold and a grasp. When they're in the ground, that's a different story because now you've got environment that you only have so much control over. They might be sitting in a bed of clay. You know, they could be at a right. low point in the yard where all the water settles. Um, and, yeah, you don't always know that. That's a challenge for sure. Yeah, so pots I, I, pots, pots are, are much more controlled. Much more controllable, exactly, as far as yeah. that goes. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Where are we here? I think we're caught up. Oh, somebody was asking what part of Oregon did Lance move to, and Lance responded on Facebook. Thank you, Lance. Yeah. He is just south of Portland where his grandkids are. So, you know what? Yes, he's talking about being a California guy for many, many years and then moving to Oregon quite a bit uh, – Quite a difference, I should say, as far as the climate and the rain. You probably won't have to water as much, Lance, in Oregon as, uh, as things begin to uh, unfold for you with your new venture. And again, we thank Lance for being with us uh, the first hour of the show, if you're on BizTalk Radio. <laughs> Carla wrote, well, I guess gin is one way to get me out of the summer doldrums. <laughs> <laughs> so true. That was good, yeah. You exactly. know, you know, but Patty wrote something about, I am interested in the fragrant plants, and she asked about if the bergamot was a, a, a fragrant shrub. Now, um, I am also interested in fragrant shrubs because I like the idea of being able to walk through your yard sure. and have fragrances as you kind of, you know, meander through. And um, you mentioned lavender. Those are excellent yeah, to just, add. It's just so nice to go out there and smell that nice, fresh lavender. Yep. Now, some of it's more evening than, than daytime, right? Yeah, like there's there's the different lavenders, right. and some exude them at different times mm -hmm. of the day. But, you know, in general, lavender is a good one. I've um, There's some dwarf eucalyptus now, too, which also, you know, eucalyptus mm -hmm. fragrance is great. And um, I have some of those in my yard. Um, you know, but then, you know, we when we talk about the herbs you know lance, lance mentioned herbs for the gin but you know mints oreganos right. chives um you know rosemary thyme i'm gonna cut in real quick all right rosemary and thyme remember that as we continue is that the show yeah we've got to take a break here uh on uh, biz talk radio our friends on uh, facebook live will be back even quicker so those on biz talk radio thank you for tuning into our show supporting our many sponsors and the sponsors of the network in the meantime, it's Brian Maine, yours truly, along with Tiger Pelafox. We're going to take a break. Thank you for tuning in to Garden America. Hey, hey, we are back. Uh, back in the saddle, that is, after a couple of weeks off. Brian Maine, Tiger Pelafox. want to thank you for tuning in on Facebook Live, as you do. Those on Biz Talk Radio, those who support the show, remember to go to our uh, YouTube channel, Garden America Radio Show. You can catch up on shows. You can stop, pause, rewind, uh, listen to the various guests. Also, our website. Very important to keep up on what's happening with our website at GardenAmerica.com. So we are back. Uh, Tiger, I had to interrupt you to go to a break, but no uh, you problem. were talking about the various, you know, rosemary and thyme. And yeah, I mean, the herbs that you can introduce into your landscape. Um, Lance had mentioned fennel and angelica, which give off a licorice fragrance as well, and they're very fragrant through the yard as well. I'm not a huge licorice fragrant fan. I'm not a black licorice guy at all. But, um, you know, those are for people, you know, there are the people out there that like that black licorice. Oh, of course. oh no, I get it. I'm, I'm a red licorice guy. Yeah. There's Some even... people might say that's not even real licorice, you know? <laughs> yeah, a twizzle, is, twizzle stick's not real licorice. Are you kidding me? No way. <laughs> it's just not a red-dyed sugar. <laughs> exactly. But I get it. Licorice to a lot of people is, is very important, and they love it. Yeah. Um, we had a question. Lisa, can I cut back my lavender now? So summertime, cutting back lavender. Um, if you're deadheading lavender, you're, you're, pulling off, you're, you're cutting back the flowers, I would say yes. Now you don't want to cut back too much though in lavender, do you? Or that's not? my thing. Is I I've in in somebody out there maybe that has more experience with lavender than me can chime in, but whenever I've cut back lavender, it's almost been like a 50-50 thing, where no matter what time of year I cut it back in, if I cut it back, sometimes it comes back and sometimes it doesn't. So I tell people not to. 
Um, just because you you if if you don't need to cut it back, just don't. Right. You know, you can remove the flowers like we talked about. You can deadhead, but cutting back the plant sometimes does more harm than good. Now, I will also say that most lavenders you can find at a garden center in a one gallon size container, and buy, buy a new you just one, buy right? a new one and you put one in, and you know, ten bucks or whatever it is. Um, so but, be conservative. Uh, yeah, but um, I don't cut them back, especially you know as we get into the summertime, because I feel like. When you cut it back in the summertime, you're you're watering usually pretty regularly, mm -hmm. and I found that you overwater the plant. Now it's cut back; it doesn't have the foliage, it doesn't have the plant, and now you're going to overwater and it's going to rot out. So that's my own two cents on it. So I would not cut it back if you don't have to, but I would deadhead. I would deadhead. The okay. Matter. Yeah. Okay. What would you say today's topic has been, Tiger? If somebody's tuning in right now. Because we've gone in a few directions, but uh, <laughs> what's our topic been? How to make gin with Lance Walheim? Well, I think that was our, our big topic, yeah. Right, but then I right. think that at the same time, we've kind of touched on um, fragrant or, uh, you, know, um, you know, oil plants right. in general. Oil plants, exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, boy, Lance has quite the thing going there. He's very excited, and we're very happy for Lance Walheim. Yeah. And uh, thank you to those that had questions. And uh, we talked about, uh, you know, non-alcoholic uh, ways of doing this which yeah, is very popular you mentioned that yeah that's becoming real popular and you know because i mean it, it just comes down to you really want to have the drink but you don't need to have the the buzz or whatever after See, this is the whatever. danger of alcoholic drinks that taste really sweet and good. <laughs> good you're like i'll have another one of course yeah sure give me a third one and yeah. then you realize that's, i mean that's uh -oh. your that's your danger right you love the limoncello right but you also know that you drink three of them and that's a lot of alcohol. After you know, the one limoncello that I haven't had since we were in Italy is pistachio. Oh, yeah. There was orange, lemon, and pistachio. The three that I remember when we went to a tasting in, I forget, Florence, Venice, wherever it was. Anyway, the pistachio was fantastic. And now you really like good. the creamy Love the cream, yeah. That's the, that was the one that you really liked, right? right? Which, which is, you can get it. It's not yeah. as easy to get as the, the regular that's basically vodka-based. Right. You know, like ice. Lance was saying, he just right. Uh, uh, what did he What did he describe it as? As, as a um, just basic alcohol, you know, like a vodka yeah, based, like, like a thing. vodka based. In his case, he was yeah. talking about gin, though, right? Right, right, right. But even gin is like a, a basic alcohol that they just infuse with the juniper beer. With with the creamy limoncello, pistachio, orange, you can pour it over ice cream, like mm. vanilla ice cream. Oh my gosh, is it good? Yeah, talk about a a treat on a hot summer day. It's do perfect. you do you like pistachios in general? Yeah, sure. It's yeah. interesting because pistachio is a flavor that, you know, you see pistachio ice cream, you right. see pistachio pie. Um, they have a lot of pistachio everything. But then when you think of it as a um, just a nut in general, mm -hmm. like not everybody eats yeah. them or likes Pistachios. them. Yeah, exactly. And nuts are expensive now, too. Oh, like, wow. Like you know, when, we're, when we were driving through the valley, there's a lot of pistachio farms, too, in central sure. California. So it was kind of neat to see those trees growing. Yeah. So, so you were in how many different states? Let's see. Four. California, Nevada, Arizona, and Utah. Four. So you had you had different um, different costs per gallon of gasoline. Oh yeah, it ranged from seven dollars, maybe a little bit over seven dollars, down to I think the cheapest I paid was like five dollars. Yeah, that's about right in yeah. those states. Yeah. Yeah. So you start hitting seven dollars. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's when, what, what's that's the cheapest when you're gas? back in the hills. Though. What's the cheapest gas you remember as a kid? 99 cents. Yeah, okay. When I first started driving, gas was 99 cents. And I remember 28, 29 cents. Yeah. And it never it never fluctuated. That, no, not like it did. That's what you paid. Yeah. You know, you go, I get five bucks on you, put some gas in my car, let's go. Good to go. Five bucks. You know, now my strategy is this I don't wait till I'm empty, I wait till I have 100 miles to go on gas. Uh -huh. I go to the gas station. I do not look at what it costs. No, don't. And I put in 50 bucks, that's it, I'm out of there. <laughs> 50 bucks, and I don't look at the price. You know, you know, you know, you do drive a little bit, though. You do. A little bit. Your, your drive to and from work every day is a bit of driving. It's not bad. It could be worse. Yeah. You know, those people that have commutes, boy, I yeah. really feel for them. Yeah. And look at you. You've got a truck. Oh, I, I mean, and I drive all over. Today, I'm going up to Temecula. Putting, so. putting gas in your truck yeah. Is what, what used to be your portion of the rent, <laughs> you know, when you had roommates. Yep. So true. You know? So true. So that's what's going on. Hey, are we caught up with our questions on Facebook? I, I, I don't want to miss anybody. Yeah, I think so. I uh, We answered, we asked, can I cut back the lavender now? 
And um, I think that was the last question at the moment. Oh, Patty's trying to find an image of the uh, Walheim gin label. Oh, yeah. I was trying to find that, too, and I couldn't find it, Patty. So it wasn't on the um, Forger Spirit website. But we'll get we'll get something. We'll get something from Lance for sure. Oh. Um, what? Was this why you were asking yeah, exactly. I, yeah. what was the topic? That was my way of backdooring that to question. Today. Yeah. So thank you for that. We do appreciate that. Hey, what is your latest failure in your garden? Mm. In fact, we can we can pose that to people on Facebook. Yeah. What is your latest failure and what is your latest success? So those on Facebook, if you want to to write that in the comments, how about you, Tiger? You know what? Um, I am not having great success with my Michaelia Champaca Alba tree right now. So it's a it's a flowering tree, produces a very beautiful white uh, flower, very fragrant. And I've got it planted. It's been there for two years. And for some reason right now, it's just not doing well. But it's done well in the past, right? It has. Okay. And I've been wa- the monitoring the water. Does, does the heat have anything to do with it? I think so. But they actually don't mind too much heat. It is somewhat protected. And it's in the ground, obviously. It's in the ground. I've been... I. I cut back the watering. I increased the watering. Have I fertilized you it? it. You fed it. You I did, fertilized you, it. You've done everything that we would ask somebody who's tuning into the show. Yeah, and I did see some bugs on it, but I've been away for two weeks. So I um, now my goal is to now treat the bugs to see if that was the problem. So we'll see if I can get this, McKelly. I think I'm going to give it a, a shot of um, HB 101 this week, too. You know what? When all else fails, HB, HB 101. 101. You do. You do. Because it sounds like that's what it needs. Yeah. And and this is what we suggest to people. When you've tried everything, you've watered, you've fertilized, plant food, not overwatering, watering enough, and it still looks a little peaked. HB one hundred one. Yep. Exactly. Right? So I'm gonna give it a shot this week, and hopefully it'll come back or or do better because it's not. It's struggling. It's not dying. No, it's just struggling. Yeah. It's like a little like a B twelve shot. Yeah. The HB one hundred one. Exactly. Which which we suggest. What's happening? Um. I think everything's good in my garden. What did yeah. I? I'm trying to think if I lost anything recently. Uh, I got. I've got to think about that because most everything's doing okay. You know. You know. The funny thing is, um, I have a lot of bananas along my house. You know. I. You know. You know that. Are I, these fruiting banana yeah, trees? Yeah, fruiting bananas. Okay. I got them along my house, um, and I, I don't. I don't. I'm not in love with them. You know, they they don't produce a great fruit that I love to eat. So therefore, I'm like, eh, you know, it's more it, of a tropical look. It is. It gives me a, a good look, right? Mm-hmm. But they're alongside the house where I have a trailer, my where I park my trailer, and um, they they add that tropical look. But I got to be careful; I can't let them get too crazy. Um, they love the heat, though, right? So oh, yeah, since I've been absolutely. gone, they've gr- you you were talking about your tree. These bananas have grown so much since I've been gone. It's crazy how quickly they grow. You know what I've learned about my two banana trees? Not to overwater. Yeah, they retain so much moisture. And it looks like they need water, which was what happened to my last one that grew real big. And then it just kind of fell over and rotted away. Yeah. And then uh, two weeks later, here comes another shoot, which I now have. It's growing again. Not quite as fast. But they, they retain so much water that that was my mistake. Oh, I overwatered it. Yeah, you just, thought, you, you just thought you couldn't go wrong, right? Like right. It, yeah. it, 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 you, There's never too much water on a banana. Right. And that's but, not the case. Yeah, exactly. That's not the case. Um, so, so that one that did rot and fall over, right. you said was coming back. It came back already. It's, yeah, it's I was about say. three feet high right now. Okay. So it, 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 and it came back from the middle? Yeah, there was a little stub. Yes. I'm like, what what is this? It, it, I let it go and it became a banana tree. If you cut down a banana, somehow it just comes back right from the it middle came again. Right back from the middle. Exactly. Yeah, it's crazy. Darndest thing. Yeah. That's kinda neat. But I think so I it's kinda neat that it came all the way back. Came all the way back. It's not growing as fast as as, as you don't last need time. It to, right? I don't need, actually. You know what? You're right because yeah. I don't want it to overgrow where it is. We've got to take a break. I'm going way over time on this oh, segment goodness. by about two minutes. So uh, those <laughs> on Biz post. Talk Radio, this will be an edited segment when I package this and send it to the network. Brian Maine, John Bagnas goes off till next week. Tiger Palafox, this is Garden America. Back after these messages on Biz Talk Radio.
All righty, we are back here on Garden America having a good time. Brian Maine, Tiger Palafox, such a joy to come into the studio each and every week. We were off the past couple of weeks, as you know. But again, looking at the, the attendance today, those tuned in, I should say, on Facebook Live, you're all back even more so and ready to go. All right, uh, we talked about failures and success in the garden. Uh, Scott says that he uh, overwatered New Guinea impatient, drooped, and didn't recover. <laughs> we were talking about that. Just talking that. about yeah. that, Scott. You're not alone, Scott. Also, Lance says he'll have more info on the website soon. Thanks for checking. I'm, can you see? Um, I, I can see a, lot, a couple of people saying thanks for the reminder about HB 101. We'll use it on dwarf mondo grass. There was a, I can't see all the, I'm trying to do it on my phone. And um, Carla wrote, I have a pepper question above. I can't see it though. So can you look up and see if you see her pepper question? And then um, I will continue. Um, it may need cotton seed meal for the acid, which I'm assuming is associated with my um, uh, Michaelia. I will give that a try. And then Kim wrote success with cannas, which, oh, they love the heat and, they grow super quick right now. Be careful with snails and slugs on those. And my plumerias drive me crazy. I was going to bring in some plumeria flowers. I got a ton of plumeria flowers right now. Really? I'm really happy with my plumeria production. Oh, that's excellent. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'll am I'm. post some pictures when it comes to that. Hey, hey Jimmy says, uh, HB 101 rules. Happy holiday. Yes, happy 4th to all of you out there. Be safe. Yeah, I'm in Allied Gardens. Will dwarf crown of thorns grow in my landscape? Full sun. They love... Allied Gardens, and they love full, full sun. sun, right? Yes, the dwarf crown of thorns. Now, one mistake people make is they put them in areas, and they put um, rocks or mulch around the base of it, and they do rot out real quickly with any kind of um, soil that's going to sit at the base of that crown of thorns. So be careful with that. Put it in an area with well-draining soil, and don't let mulch or rock go up right to the base of the plant. And then right below that is a rose question, yeah. starting off by saying, even though John isn't here, <laughs> we'll see what we can do with this one. My wife inadvertently, oh, uh, Johnny, my wife inadvertently cut off the main runner of the one-gallon Peggy Martin rose that I planted next to a column. Will it ever sprout a new main runner? It's been months. Its twin has six-foot runner. Should I just buy another plant? Okay, Peggy Martin now we know is very tenacious. And I have one. I have two in my yard. Right. And when I've cut them back, they have produced new main runners. Now, I will say um, that they are very uh, climbing shrub-like in that way, that they will produce new main runners. So I've had success where they have produced new runners, and they've done just fine. With even, having cut off what they cut even off? Even with cutting off the main I would one. say hang in there. Yeah. So I was going to say, my next question was going to be, how, when did this happen? Because a lot of people also, you know, think, oh, roses right now would be growing. But, you know, you know, John's talked this about this a lot, is that in the summertime, you know, they've gone through their first flowering cycle. Mm -hmm. They almost sit a little bit almost like dormant minor for a while. Sitting, minor sitting dormant right And now. then in the fall is when you'll see right. the growth. So, you know, he, he says he hasn't seen growth. And if it had happened something like, oh, you know, late spring, right before mm -hmm. the summer, that's fully normal for it not to grow. That, that's a good point. That, during like this said, time of year. It's almost like they're dormant. Yeah. I don't have any any rose uh, roses in bloom right now myself. And maybe that's the case with the Peggy Martin, even though the other one is, is blooming. You can have two roses side by side. Yeah. Very healthy. One's blooming. One isn't. Yeah. You know, you've got yeah. kids. One kid's healthier than the other kid. <laughs> Right, they're yes. all different. Yes, it's you know, there's no. We'd like to think there's a template. Yeah, for the most part, there is sometimes, but again, they're all individuals. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. Um, Tanya, plumeria question. You mentioned in the past that they something they need in order to bloom. Yes, um, we mentioned from Grow More Hawaiian, Hawaiian Bloom, Hawaiian Bud and Bloom, Hawaiian Tropical. It's a Grow More product. Um, and it's grow, a grow more product. Grow more right. product, and a um, it comes in a little canister. You mix it with water, and I think it's Hawaiian bud and bloom. But you know, John, who had plumerias for years that weren't blooming for him, he put that on there, and with great success, they bloomed the first year. Wow! Um, and I've been using Tatiana's products, and I I keep forgetting the name of her product line. You know, but a, Top Tropicals. Top Tropicals. If you go to their website. Um, they have a fertilizer line, um, and they have some stuff specifically for plumerias as well. And 
I just said my Vumeris are looking great, and I will say I think it's because of the fertilizers I've been using from Tatiana. Yeah. So um, I'm a huge advocate of those. Maybe a little harder to get, but um, you know you you got to order them online. But depending on where you're at, you might have to order the um, Grow More Hawaiian Bud and Bloom. But that is toptropicals.com. Well. Yeah, toptropicals.com. You can get, find them there. And then Patty's got a question for us, Tiger. Um. Uh. Wait a minute. Um. Uh, wait a few minutes. Restart. It. Okay. Um. I thought our Hong Kong orchid tree, our Hong Kong, our Hong Kong orchid tree was a goner a month ago. It lost all leaves. My husband soaked it a couple times, and now the leaves are coming back. Now, Patty, I brought in some bugs three weeks ago or so yeah. that were on my orchid tree right. that were actually stink bugs that mm -hmm. were attacking my tree, and that might have been what you had happening at the same time. Um, and you know they come back. They're 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 yeah, kind of like the uh, the Sclepius, you know, monarch butterfly that attacks the Sclepius, and you know it decimates the tree. But then they go and move on their way, and then the tree comes back after that. So if you want to prevent that in the future, sometimes check out for those bugs because it was actually really hard for me to see. I didn't see the bugs initially. Right. So um, you might have had that depending on where your tree was. You might not have noticed that they were getting decimated by those uh, stink bugs. Um, and so. Um, you know, but again, fertilizer and watering right now, you almost can't go wrong with a Hong Kong orchid tree because they, they love it. And I've seen orchid trees that have gotten too much water and they grow crazy fast. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, some are able to do that. Yeah. Um, that is the best product. I love it for everything. Yeah, Grow, Grow More. More. Yeah. Shout out to yeah, Grow they have More. A lot of, they have a lot of products. Grow More has a lot of products, um, fertilizers. And um, there are a lot of water-soluble products, which means you mix them in a watering can or a bucket of water, and then you water your plants. You know, we've talked about a lot of products. We should talk about one of our major sponsors, Fertilome. Yeah. Uh, we want to thank Fertilome for being a major sponsor of Garden America. And when people think of Fertilome, I know I did in the beginning, oh, yeah, that, that's a fertilizer. But, Tiger, you're very involved with this company. They're, they're much more than fertilizer. They have a lot of, lot of different uh, things for your garden, a lot of products, correct? Yeah, definitely. And, you know, one of the best products, we just talked about these uh, stink bugs and we're talking about other things happening right now. I love their spinosad soap because spinosad soap takes care of chewing insects like caterpillars, grasshoppers, those kinds of things. But it also takes care of the sucking insects like aphids, scale, mealybug at the same time. And it's safe to use. You know, there's not a lot of products out there that are safe to use and also take care of those specific bugs. So um, Fertilome um, produces a, a product line called Natural Guard, and they're, that's spinosad soap. So that is one thing I always have in my shed because right. no matter what the bug is, I can spray that it's on there. It's a standard. And it, it works. It works. Exactly. So I love that product. Um, you do have to be careful with any oil-based spray because if you spray it in the middle of the hot day, you'll burn your plants. Right. But if you get out there in the early morning or late evening, you're fine. And people always ask about bees, so mm -hmm. so you don't want to spray them the bee directly on yeah, it exactly. and you want to spray it like you like you mentioned at the time of the day and then let it dry out yeah and then you know you know tomatoes are another thing that get worms right now a lot of vegetables are getting worms right now and that's another great product to use because it's fully safe to use on all your edible plants right i remember so years ago soap. when i saw a big tomato hornworm it came out from the patio <laughs> And, and, you, and, it, you know, and it talked to you? Well, <laughs> no, but you. I stepped back. I'm like, whoa, boy. Oh, hey, Brian. Easy. Easy, cowboy. <laughs> you know? B big big old, you know, three or four inches of protein. Reminds me of that uh, worm from Alice in Wonderland. Right, exactly. It's like, hey, he starts talking to you. You're like, whoa, or, or big what's, guy. What's that, uh, what is that creature in Star Wars in the bar scene? Oh, Jabba, Jabba the Hutt? Is that, I think, something I think like Jabba that. Jabba the yeah, Hutt yeah. or something like that, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, tomato horn. I haven't seen one in years, but <laughs> um, that's, that's, that's from a moth. It's, yeah. a, it's a metamorphosis of a moth, correct? Yeah, yeah, the tomato horn worm is a moth. Because um, people wonder, how the heck did, did that get in my garden? Yep, yeah, 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 they get there. They get there. They know their ways. They'll find their way. Yeah. If you have tomatoes or something need, succulent, they'll find it. Yeah, if, if it's chewing on plants, like, you know, tomatoes and those edible plants a lot of times they're moths you know butterflies more stick to yes. the flowering shrubs mm -hmm. and um you know a lot of times they don't i mean I, I i may speak not correctly because monarchs will decimate an asclepius but um a lot of times the butterflies you know caterpillars don't always decimate a plant right but
And I am yeah. seeing more monarchs here and there. You know, they're finding research that the population might be might be coming up again. Fingers crossed. You know. We need to take a break. All right. Our final segment on this Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon coming up next here on Garden America. Those on BizTalk Radio, thank you for listening. This is last week's show. Those on Facebook Live, hey, guess what? This is this week's show. We're going to take a break. I'm Brian Main. John Bagnas goes out. Tiger Palafox with me. Back after these messages on BizTalk Radio. Okay, like I said, mics are hot. We are back in studio from a couple of weeks off, a hiatus. John is back with us uh, next weekend, so thank you for tuning in. Those on BizTalk Radio, those on Facebook Live. A lot of good questions and comments. Uh, did you read Kevin's uh, comment there, Tiger, during the break? Yeah, and we got Carla's question about peppers sure. that she reposted here. Um, so let me read Carla's first, yep. and then I'll get to Kevin. Carla, candy cane, red pepper, and five-gallon pot not doing well. Leaves curling into cylinder shape and not growing water too much too little feeding um i would say watering too much because um peppers don't really like a lot of water and fertilizing should be regularly you know john's always a huge advocate of osmocote right but i'm also an advocate of any organic fertilizer putting it on monthly and um the leaves curling also tell me that um you know there could be could be something going on with the roots where maybe because of the overwatering, you might be having a, a rot issue as well. So let it dry out a little bit, fertilize it, and um, kind of go from there. And whenever that's happened to me, I've also, and peppers don't need shade, but I've moved it um, into the shade for a little less stress because, you know, they like the full sun. So right. they're always out there fully exposed. And um, But I moved it in the shade and it's perked back up. So fertilize cut back on the watering and i think that your pepper will be fine um kevin who moved to idaho uh, and you know what i love this comment because this kind of just shows you the importance of some plants to people right but um after moving here to idaho we brought our lantern plants indoors and it developed a horrific scale infestation that was killing the plant i've been carefully rubbing the stems with hydrogen peroxide on q-tips and cotton pads it's time consuming but i think i'm winning the battle and, um, you know, Kevin, yeah, you know, more you, power Kevin. to you. Yeah. Keep going with it. Um, you know, the other thing mm -hmm. that can help battle with scale isn't isn't going to be proven. But um, I've always found that um, worm castings have always helped with the just overall health of a plant. Right. Right. And yeah. so just putting a little bit of worm castings on your soil um, has helped with the overall vigor and uh, production of oils in the plant which ultimately help protect the plant down the road. So if you're if you're putting in that much effort to remove the scale, I would do a little bit of worm castings on the soil sure. at the same time. So, you know, great job, Kevin. Wow. Yeah. We, huh? Hey, thank you all for being a part of the show today. Lots of questions, lots of fun comments, new people, and um, it's it's fun to be back, Brian. Yeah, it is fun. You know, it, and, and again, we I think we had to shake the rust off a little bit the first uh, segment, <laughs> you know, trying to, trying, to, trying to find our way here. Now, John is still with family. He's back next week. Uh, yep. So the three of us will be back as, as one whole team. Uh, but, uh, yeah, 4th of July weekend. So you just got back from vacation. Yeah. What, what do you got planned work. this 4th of July weekend? I got work. Work, right? Yeah, you yeah, I'm, fun. I'm, I'm working today. You know, my family is still uh, – my, my wife is still visiting her family up in Central California, Northern California area. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm uh, alone. So I figured why not get all my work done so when they come back – I will have some vacation time. So you said she's in Northern California? Yeah, yeah. Whereabouts? She's up near San Jose, Morgan Hill area. Oh, okay. And yeah. my wife's sister lives in San Jose. Okay. And my wife is from the Bay Area. Palo oh, really? Alto. Palo Alto, huh? Yes. Yeah. That's Stanford, right? Isn't Stanford in Palo Alto? Uh, do, or no? Do, 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 no, Stanford's further south, I think. Oh, okay. I think. Of course, we'll have somebody that can correct us. Yeah. I, l I like the Palo Alto area. I've been mm -hmm. there. Yeah. It's... um. Become quite expensive. Yes. Like everything else in California. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. tremendously Bay area, so. For sure. That whole Bay Area. Much like a lot of California. Yeah. You know, that that that's just the case, as as the case may be. Uh worm what is uh Kevin says, worms do thrive here in the soils. Yeah. Uh, Tanya does say Palo Alto. 
Okay, good job. All right. Good job. Yeah. You know so, your, your Stanford geography better than I do. Yeah, and um, I just want to also caution everybody because driving through California, you know, certain areas allow for fireworks, which are yes. fun to do during 4th of July, but we are very hot and dry. Yeah, really? Be very careful using fireworks this weekend. Were if you a you kid are that played with the fireworks? Oh, I, I love playing I, fireworks. I was. I love them. M80s, love them. cherry bombs. Yeah. The cherry yeah. bombs were, were interesting because you could light them and toss them in water. Uh huh. And they would still blow up. It right. Was a waterproof fuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But those M80s, my yeah. gosh. I, I think... mean, I grew up going down to Mexico too, where they have all those fireworks yeah. as well. So, you know, I mean, I love them. Just be safe. Be, be safe. careful a lot, because a lot of states they're legal. You might pull off the side of the road. There's a firework stand. Yep. Yeah, exactly. And you know, just got to be careful. Be smart when doing them. Or just and... leave it to the experts. Go someplace <laughs> Go watch. and watch. I don't know. You remember that one year the experts in San Diego completely messed it up? Oh yeah, that the big a... bang. And it was they, a, they lit off all the fireworks at once. It was a big fizzle. That, that's right. <laughs> yeah, for those of you not knowing, in San Diego one time, they have this big uh, fireworks show in the Bay where they have three barges in the Bay. And there and was they're a, just building up this big, intense thing yeah, that's going to be happening. I, it's a long show. It's a long fireworks show. And um, so they had a computer malfunction, and all three barges with all their fireworks shut them all off at once. And it was over. So it was like five a thirty. Seconds. It was like a thirty-second show. That was it. That was supposed to be like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah, and that was it. That was crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> that that is nuts. Okay, we've got about uh, three minutes here. I think we're caught up on the uh, the questions, the comments. Uh, uh, next week. Next week. Yeah, next week. Those listening. John will be back, yes. and we have Adam Kober, a landscape designer. Now, Adam Kober's um, a designer that focuses on using. Um, edibles slash more natural elements in his design. So we're going to be talking landscape design um, where you can incorporate, you know, plants that you can use, but at the same time, more natural elements. So, you know, more wood, more rock um, into your landscape just to give it a little bit more of a natural feel, which I think is important for people to know. They don't have to do it all the way, maybe how Adam does it. But, um, you know, a lot of people in, you know, track home neighborhoods, you know, they put a lot of concrete in, they put a lot of walls in right away, and they don't add too much of the natural elements, which gives that yard that great feel. So something that matches the environment and more or less blends in to, to whatever your theme is. Yeah, and I think that's why, right? Because it blends in. Yeah. It, you, you don't need to walk out there and see billboards all over the place. No, something that blends in and looks like it was there before you even moved in. Yeah. Like, oh, this has always been there. It's part of the environment. Part of, part of, part of what I do. Exactly. I imagine I'll be watering today. Maybe. Depends. Yeah. Because even though I've, I've been watering and, and I have pots, um, and just because it's hot doesn't mean that they're all draining at the same rate. Right. That some are going to retain the water more than others. In some areas, there's a good two to three hours of shadows as well. I was going to say, you have some areas in your patio that are more sunny than other areas, right. which also can make it exactly. dry out quicker. Exactly. Hey, that's going to do it. Awesome. Tiger, we did it. Thank you very much for those tuned in on BizTalk Radio. You, yes, I'm talking about you on Facebook Live. Thank you for tuning in, watching our show. We trust that you'll have a good rest of your 4th of July weekend. Do be safe. Have a great uh, following week. And please join us again next week here. John Bagnasco will be back. Myself, Brian Main, Tiger Palafox. Until then, as uh, we used to always say but lately have been forgetting, for all of us here at Garden America, get growing. Take care.